us some advice that you've provided to SNCs in a mentoring space or, or even SNCs that you've worked with as colleagues um, to, to keep getting better and I guess opening up more doors in elite sport? Yeah, I think uh, relationships are key. Um, earning, earning your right and, and earning your way is hard in proving that you've got a, a good work ethic. Um, I said before, both I was very lucky that I grew up in an environment in Northwest England where you, you kind of everybody, I felt like everybody just worked really hard. Certainly my parents did and, and the rest of my wider family. And, and then I was lucky again that I went into a, um, a working class environment at, at Sail Sharks, even though a lot of the rugby union players back then and still to this day, I suppose in the UK, are private school educated and there's a perception that they don't work as hard. I think that myth's gone now that they, they do work bloody hard. What's your sort of take on internships, if you like, and, and earning your way from putting in time early on in the career? Like, what, what's your take yeah. on it? Yeah, when I started, they weren't really called internships. It was just, um, I just was a volunteer. And so I just went and helped out with lots of strength and conditioning stuff. And it was purely because I was so passionate about it. I really, really wanted to get better. And I felt like as I was learning more on this master's, I, I needed to experience experience it. And I wanted, to, I wanted that feeling of coaching people and helping improve the way they move. And I wanted to see how they adapted, all of those things. And so um, that was what I was supposed to doing lots of internships. But as I was sharing to you earlier, that um, there's another side to that as well. Like the first uh, three or four jobs I took, actually, right back to those Doncaster days, where I took that role, I, I kind of knew what sort of salary I would be getting paid, but um, but I didn't I didn't really care about it. Has there been a program, or or if there hasn't, with the what what would your belief be on it? Where you feel like the leaders and the majority of the playing group are all in and they're obsessed to win, um, but the football department isn't, or vice versa. Do you think you can still get ultimate success, or do you need the key pillars of staff and the playing group to be all in and obsessed for? For team first success yeah good question actually i, I think if the, if you've got the players and especially the leadership group yeah if if they are aligned and and obsessed um, and desperate for success and willing to pay the price um for success i think you're 70 percent, 80 percent of the way there and mm -hmm. um, i think we can sometimes overestimate our impact as coaches actually mm -hmm. i think um at the true elite end um I understand and I'm, I'm sure we'll get on to how we can add value physically uh, from a strength and conditioning perspective. But I do think all of the different coaching areas, like players players win games, players win leagues. There's no question. How, how do you find data can help inform decision-making in those sort of high-pressured environments? Yeah, so I, I like um, analogies and, and metaphors for this sort of stuff with, with players and other coaches. I think... The way I look at the data or consider the data is like the speed dials on your car. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm a big fan of training at, at match intensity or above. And um, obviously you can't do that permanently. You can't do that for, for the whole of the session. But I definitely think that stands to reason to me, logically, as the best way to prepare. You know, if we can identify what is the worst case scenario. And when I say worst case, I mean the peak intensity. Um, I'm not looking at it from an injury prevention perspective. I'm looking at it from a performance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we can identify what that looks like, um, how can we train at, at or above it? And so if we if we can track that sort of data and then that becomes the speed dials on our car. So when we're driving really, really fast down the road, um, it's not just a straight road, unfortunately. And so we, we need to keep checking the speed dials. What would be your advice for sports science recognitioning high performance staff in terms of developing what is important, whether it be an adaptation uh, aspect that you're looking for or or for performance on the field, uh, how do you go about um, having clarity on yeah, help, whether it be helping a player develop and what's an important object, you know, objective measure for them, uh, or if you're working with the consulting coaching staff. And so then there was some great research by, you know, there's a great crew, Grant Duffy, Rich Johnson, Jay Stalaney, Heidi Thornton, that crew who were looking at um, the change in pace. I call it change of pace metric. It's a lot of people call it Axel D-cell measurement, but essentially all it is looking at is Every tenth of a second, what's the difference in speed? And then averaging that over a 60-second interval, 120, all the way from one minute to 10 minutes, and started looking at that data, which is challenging to process. Um, you have to get the raw data and then process it, but those guys worked it out. It's really interesting to see that that, that I was a lot more sensitive, not just only to the position in some of the great peer-reviewed research they've put out, but that data set really allowed us to look at um, 
measuring all those moments that matter. So when you get hard off the line, that was good because then you get hard off the line, you may or may not be involved in the tackle, but then you've got to get back to the line and reload and then do it again. 